more than production. Uh, so the title of my uh, presentation is uh, Drugs and Bugs, and uh, what I'm going to be discussing is the infectious complications related to drug use. Uh, and the reason why I got interested in this topic was because I did my residency at Florida Atlantic University, and we rotated through hospitals located in Delray, Point Beach, and Boca Raton. And what I found was um, there were a lot of rehab facilities there. And I looked into this, and uh, there was a New York Times article that uh, really, that designated Delray as a haven for recovering habits. What I also noticed was that a lot of these patients were getting admitted to the ER, and a lot of them from, were from out of state, so they would fly in and get treatment um, for detox or infection-related complications. So that's where my interest kind of started. And, uh, and the further I looked into this, Palm Beach County is where I did my residency, and there was around 5,000 overdoses in the year of 2017. So it was a big drug issue in that area. In terms of epidemiology, there was around 70,000 uh, uh, drug overdoses uh, in 2017. This was the leading cause of death in the people under age 50. Now, just to put this into perspective, um, in 2017, 2018, there were only 79,000 influenza-related deaths. Um, Gun-related deaths in 2017, there was 40,000. And this is like the, like the apex of the uh, AIDS epidemic, right? In 1895, when, when there wasn't really good ARTs, there was only 45,000 deaths. So a lot of deaths from drug overdoses, right? And um, this is a map of uh, drug, over, uh, drug overdoses uh, by state. and. Uh, Anyone want to take a good guess uh, where Florida is at? You know, it's dark red. We're always in the top. We're, yeah, we're always, if it's, yeah. So we're right up there against, uh, we're one of the top states for sure. And uh, why does this matter, right? So for every, for every drug overdose, there's, uh, you know, a non-drug overdose and there's complications that come with that, whether it's mental health or medical related issues. And for us, ID related complications, right? So I kind of organized this presentation in case format, so I'm just going to present a patient and kind of uh, uh, introduce uh, drugs uh, and complications in, in that way. So I um, already went over that. So first case, 25-year-old male presents to the Dr. Ehler. Um, I can't see. Never mind. I fixed it. Uh, so a 25-year-old male presents to the ED with shortness of breath, non-productive cough, and fevers. The patient reports myalgias, malaise, chills, and pleuritic chest pain. He also reports smoking cocaine for the past week. Physical exam is notable for a fever of 102. He's a little hypoxic. He's 88% on room air and he has bivalves or crackles on physical exam. White count is 14 and he has peripheral eosinophilia. And feel free to uh, uh, blurb out the diagnosis if you, if you know it. Carlos. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, the CT chest uh, ch shows up, uh, bilateral ground glass opacities, and Carlos was right. This patient has acute eosin eosinophilic pneumonia. Um, so acute eosinophilic pneumonia is characterized by eosinic uh, infiltration of the lung. Um, if you get a biopsy, this is what you'll see. You'll see eosinophils in the lung parenchyma. Uh, it's caused by an acute hypersensitivity reaction to an inhaled uh, antigen. So patients that smoke crack cocaine, marijuana, and tobacco uh, can get this, especially patients that smoke water pipes too, because um, these devices allow for large volumes of smoke to enter uh, the lung. Uh, these patients typically present with uh, non-productive cough, shortness of breath, fevers, and hypoxemia. And labs can be non-specific, but can also show some peripheral eosinophilia, elevated IgE, and the chest radiography can be kind of all over the place, ground glass opacities, central lobular nodules, reticular opacities, really nothing that you can really put your hand on. In terms of the diagnosis, um, there's certain uh, elements uh, you need. So you need a, a febrile illness, uh, hypoxemia, uh, eight, less than 90% on room air, and a PAO2 less than uh, 60 in, on your ABG. Infiltrates in the chest radiograph, and uh, one of the most important pieces to uh, uh, coming to a, a diagnosis is uh, getting a bronchoscopy and seeing more than 25% eosinophilia. 
And of course, you got to, this is a diagnosis of exclusion. So you got to rule other things like, you know, like Cherk Strauss, uh, endemic fungi, um, strongyloides, um, inhaled pent, adaptomycin can also cause this. So getting a good history is important. In terms of treatment, um, it's supportive care. Uh, give them oxygen as needed. Empiric antibiotics until the diagnosis is confirmed, right? This is uh, kind of like when we come into, uh, uh, when we get consulted, right? There's a patient with respiratory symptoms, infiltrates in the CAT scan, and they're not getting better on antibiotics, right? We get asked what to do, so we've got to know about this. Steroids is the crux of treatment, for sure, and a cessation of smoking, right? And um, it's going to be hard to uh, cure these patients if they keep smoking. So the next case, 45-year-old female presents to the ED with hemoptysis and shortness of breath, reports smoking cocaine more than usual lately, last used cocaine less than 48 hours ago. Physical exam bilateral ronchi, urine drug screens positive for cocaine, and chest radiograph shows ground glass patchy infiltrates bilaterally. Ah, I gave it away. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, guys. So this patient has cracked lung. So, um, so cracked lung is characterized by diffuse alveolar damage and uh, hemorrhage, plus or minus pulmonary edema. And the idea behind this is that uh, when you smoke uh, crack, you got to uh, turn the powder to a liquid, right? So you got to heat it. And then to turn the liquid to a vapor, you got to heat it again. So it's really high temperatures when you, when you inhale this vapor, right? And it's literally causing a burn to your lung. And that's what causes the alveolar damage and hemorrhage. And also, cocaine itself is a vasoconstrictor, right? So it can cause pulmonary infarcts. So this typically occurs within 48 hours of smoking the, the cocaine. Uh, the patients may or may not have eosinophilia. There's um, kind of like an idea that there might be overlap between e acute eosin e eosinophilic pneumonia and cracked lung. They might have an element of it. So sometimes these patients can benefit from steroids. But the crux of the treatment is um, pretty much supportive care. The diagnosis is typically clinical, chest radiographies, ground glass opacities. And obviously they need to stop smoking, crack cocaine. This is what the chest radiograph can look like. And if they, you know, uh, adhere to uh, stop, stop uh, if they stop smoking, this is what it can look like in four weeks. And these are all real cases I pulled for the most part. All right. Case three, 41-year-old male traveling from Columbia to Florida presents to the ED with severe abdominal pain and nausea and vomiting. The patient is diaphoretic in acute distress and the abdomen is tender to palpation. The white count is 25 and the lactic acid is four. Chest CT or uh, abdominal CT shows, anyone want to give that a guess? He's a mule. <laughs> He's a <blood> <laughs> Yeah, so this is uh, known as body stuffers. So he basically has packages of uh, drugs in his abdomen. And this is what it looks like if he has a bowel movement and you clean it. So there's something called body packing and body stuffers. And there's a difference, I guess. Um, body packers, <laughs> this, is, uh, this is a lot of reading and research. It got really uh, interesting. So body packers are like smugglers. So they carry large amounts of prepackaged drugs in their bodies and they travel, you know, uh, in internationally and their intentions are to like sell and redistribute these drugs, right? Body stuffers are persons uh, who smell small amounts. And it's mainly like for like personal use or they swallow because they're scared they're going to get arrested. Their, their intent is not to sell. And I guess these body packers are broken this down broken this down into a science where um, they will use like antispasmodics and uh, medications to induce like constipation so to slow down the transit time of the drugs especially during like long international flights um, yeah more recently there was an article on yahoo and bbc about a week ago actually of a uh, death of a teacher uh, she was traveling she was vacationing in dubai yeah she traveled back to the UK, <laughs> collapsed in the UK airport, and autopsy showed a burst bag of cocaine. She died of cardiac arrest. Yeah. So I already talked about that. 
Right, and the complications from body packing and stuffing is, you know, obviously the package can cause intestinal obstruction, right? And the worst case scenario is the packages can burst, right? So, if, for example, you have cocaine, cocaine increases gastric acid secretion, also causes local vasoconstriction, ischemic damage to the bowel wall, perforation. That's when we get consulted, right? They get peritonitis. So the treatment for uh, these people is you got to decide if they're asymptomatic or symptomatic, right? So if they're not having any acute signs of drug toxicity, no bowel symptoms, you can manage them with supportive care and just observe them in the ICU, though. That's important. you got to admit them to the ICU. You can also give them polyethylene glycol to hasten the, passages, uh, the passage of the packets. Uh, and you continue it until they have two to three package-free stools. All right. But if they're symptomatic, they need to go to the OR immediately and get decontaminated. You can also give activated charcoal. And, you know, this is when we get consulted. Um, you know, one of the more common causes, uh, one of the more common complications is obstruction or perforation. And that's when we get consulted and we give antibiotics for like, you know, 10 to 14 days post-op. And antifungals 10 to 14 days post-op, right? Following source control, obviously. The, the lore about this is that rupture of just one of those containers can cause a fatal overdose. Did you find that was the case, or do some people survive that? For the most part, they all seized, mm -hmm. and they had cardiac arrest, from what I saw. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it's just a lot of drug getting absorbed. Yeah. yeah. So case four. It's a pretty straightforward one. So a 24-year-old male uh, intranasal cocaine user presents uh, with progressive nasal congestion, facial pain, and rhinorrhea for three weeks. He has a prior history of palate ulcers secondary to drug use. He goes to the ENT clinic and has the nasal endoscopy done. And once again, these are real cases. Um, when he has the endoscopy, this is what it shows. Extensive crossing with areas of necrosis. He had a CT done. Um, here's a normal CT, so you can compare, right? <laughs> so, um, his, can, can you guys see this mouse? Yeah, so his complete nasal palate and maxillary sinus is obliterated, right? So he gets a biopsy done. And what do you guys think it showed? Yes. Yeah, so uh, he was diagnosed with, with Aspergillus flavus. Um, he had debridement of all non-viable tissue. He's actually treated with amphotericin and de-escalated vori based on cultures, and he actually did pretty well. So the idea behind this is, you know, Aspergillus is ubiquitous in the environment. It's in our soil, plants, marine habitat. Uh, it can also thrive in, like, decaying tissue, right? That's where they can get their nutrients from. So, you know, this chronic nasal mucosal destruction and inflammation from the cocaine use leads to tissue necrosis and decay in the nose, and that allows the aspergillus to invade the tissue. So quickly, acute and chronic fungal sinusitis. So acute, patients present with fever, facial pain, nasal congestion. It usually occurs in the immunocompromised population. Immunocompromised meaning uh, cancer, chemotherapy, transplant. HIV, diabetes, and even uh, intranasal steroids can predispose you to fungal sinusitis. And chronic is an indolent form. Um, they may or may not have symptoms. This patient had chronic sinusitis on top of his, his acute. So they can have slow indolent sim symptoms and just have an acute change. And uh, according to the 2016 IDSA guidelines for aspergillus, uh, number one, the most important thing is surgical debridement. Uh, the drugs of choice are voriconazole versus amphotericin, and the gold trough levels if you choose vori is between 1 to 5.5. And here's a, a chart from the 2016 IDA, IDSA guidelines. So pretty much the treatment of invasive sinus aspergillosis is the same thing as pulmonary aspergillosis. All right, so a little bit about cocaine. Uh, it's estimated 1.5 million cocaine users in 2014. The highest prevalence is among ages of 18 to 25. Um, people can take it orally, IV, or intranasally. The most popular is IV and uh, intranasal. 
Uh, the mechanism of action is stimulates alpha and beta adrenergic receptors by inhibiting reuptake of norepinephrine and dopamine. Uh, it works on the reward pathway. Uh, it causes euphoria, a sense of well-being pretty rapidly, and it leaves the system pretty rapidly too, making it highly addictive. Um, it's associated with transmission of uh, HIV and hepatitis, uh, pretty much bloodborne diseases. And the acquisition of hepatitis and HIV primarily occurs two ways. A needle sharing with infected people, or number two, um, impairing the judgment of the drug user and they have like unprotected sex with an infected person. So those are the main two mechanisms. And there's some, pre some pretty interesting studies in cocaine users living with HIV. There was one done in, in the early 2000s um, showing a link between the lack of virologic suppression and the decline in CD4. Um, they pretty much uh, stated that um, HIV infected injection drug users who were on ART and continued to inject drugs were less likely to suppress their uh, HIV RNA. You know, I thought about that. I felt like it's probably due to non-compliance in these drug users. I don't know if the cocaine itself causes, you know, that. Um, but there is evidence that cocaine can suppress your CD4. In terms of HIV and hepatitis prevention, um, it's like a multiple, like a multi-prong attack, right? So um, one component of preventing bloodborne diseases is uh, awareness and diagnosing people with HIV, uh, getting them linked into care, retaining them in care, putting them on antivirals and suppressing them, right? And then the whole U equal U thing, right? And another component is PrEP, which stands for pre-exposure prophylaxis. Um, this, stand, uh, this is a way for people who do not have HIV but are at high risk of getting it, right? So you put them on PrEP. And then there's post-exposure prophylaxis. Uh, and this is used f uh, in situations where someone was exposed to HIV, whether it was through a needle stick or a sexual encounter. And just remember, you want to start these people on PrEP within 72 hours of their exposure. And then there's SSP. SSP stands for Syringe Service Programs. This is another component to prevention, right? And um, this is a big reason why patients are, or people are sharing needles is because they have poor access to clean needles. So they'd, they'd rather get high over anything. So they'll just recycle the needles with whoever. So right now there are currently 320 syringe service programs in North America. The program provides these people with clean access to needles, they give them advice on safer injection practices, so sterilizing the area, giving them alcohol swabs. They also uh, uh, provide safe handling of the needles and appropriate disposal of the used needles. Uh, they will test them for HIV, and if they're positive, send them to treatment centers. Uh, they also get referred for drug treatment if they need, if they want it. Um, and um, there was a study in Vancouver um, and, um, uh, the late 90s actually, and they looked at the needle sharing rates pre and post SSP initiation. And the pre SS and needle sharing rate was around 38%. And after initiation of this program, it went down to like six to seven percent. It was so it was a really big success. And they found that there's a reduction in the HIV uh, hepatitis transmission rate. Can anyone guess how many SSPs there are in Florida, considering where we're like a high prevalent state, right? It was one, oh. but now it's three. So there is a recent bill passed a few months ago uh, that allowed needle exchange programs to be expanded. So now there's three. The first one was at UM. Um, that program right now has a thousand, about a thousand people enrolled. 42% 40 per, of that uh, thousand, so 420 have hepatitis C. 8% have HIV. And they've, they've exchanged like thousands and thousands of needles. The second one's in Miami and the third one is in West Palm now. So there's only three total, which I felt was pretty sad considering we we're pretty high prevalence. All right, case five. 25 year old female with the history of IV heroin use presents with fevers, temperatures 102, new murmur consistent with tricuspid regurgitation, has track marks, uh, wet counts 15, blood culture, staph aureus, echo one centimeter veg, pretty straightforward, endocarditis, right? So uh, the, 
the prevalence of endocarditis in people that people who inject drugs is on the rise due to the growing opioid epidemic. If you look at the graphic to the right, in 2010, 15% of all infective carditis admissions was related to drug use. 2015, it almost doubled to 29%. And I'm not really going to talk about the management of um, uh, I, uh, endocarditis, um, but I do want to bring up a trial that the fellows and I went over Monday, and I'd like to share, share it with you guys. So um, there's a, a trial that recently came out called uh, the POET trial. It stands for partial oral versus IV antibiotic treatment of endocarditis. And uh, what they did was um, they looked at patients with left-sided endocarditis, and they asked the question whether a transition from IV to oral antibiotics would be non-inferior to a six-week course of uh, uh, IV antibiotics. And the pathogens they looked at were strep, coagulative staph, Enterococcus fecalis and Staph aureus, and what they did was, um, if the patients uh, uh, were stable after a 10-day course of IV antibiotics, they they randomized them to the IV uh, arm or the oral arm, and the patients that were randomized to the oral arm were treated with two different antibiotics with moderate to high bioavailability, and had two different mechanisms of action, and they were discharged and they were followed up outpatient two to three times per week. We know that's never going to happen in real life. So the primary outcomes they looked at was mortality, unplanned cardiac surgery, embolic events, and relapse of bacteremia. And these were their results. Statistically, not significant, though. But uh, if you look at the all-cause mortality, um, the oral arm um, had 3% less. Uh, unplanned cardiac surgery, they both had 3%. Embolic rate was 1.5% for both. And the relapse of uh, positive blood culture 2.5 for both. So overall, I felt like it was a good study. I don't think we're ready to incorporate this into our practice yet, but it, I feel like it's, it's a step in the right direction, uh, and we need more you know, studies backing this up. And the study limitations, there were, there were a lot. Um, you know, it only had left-sided endocarditis patients. No HASIC organisms were included. Um, no patients had MRSA. There were only five IV drug users, and they all had to follow up pretty strictly two to three times per week. And some of the oral antibiotics they used were uh, not available in America. It was a Danish study. So uh, skin uh, soft tissue infections. So this is uh, a patient or two different patients with uh, abscesses in their foot. And um, long-term long IV drug users, um, they run out of veins eventually, right? So they resort to a phenomenon called uh, skin popping. So skin popping refers to injecting drugs into the subcutaneous tissue. And the most common site is the lower extremities. And it can cause cellulitis, abscesses, and I, forget, I left out, it can also cause neck fash too. Uh, these patients compared to just intravenous drug users are at five times greater risk for uh, skin soft tissue infections. And the most common organisms uh, is staph and strep, like usual. Uh, and the treatment is, of course, uh, uh, incision and drainage and uh, antibiotics, right, source control. So uh, this is a green map. What drug do you think this represents? <laughs> so this is a, yeah, yeah. So, yep, so. Marijuana laws are changing pretty rapidly, right? So this map represents pretty much every state to a certain extent has accepted marijuana. Um, uh, Florida recently uh, legalized medical marijuana. There's 10 states in the dark green. It's legal recreationally. So we need to know the complications for marijuana, right? So marijuana can be consumed orally or inhaled. Um, there's currently 147 million people worldwide that use cannabis. And the active ingredient is tetrahydrocannabinol. There's two receptors in the body. There's one centrally, one peripherally. They're called the cannabinoid one and the cannabinoid two receptors. Um, Colorado um, was probably the first state that made uh, uh, marijuana a recreational. And during the, after the, its first year, it created 18,000 new jobs from cultivating it manufacturing it and selling it and it generated 
$4 billion for the economy. So I think that's why you see a lot of green here now. Um, you know, it's only going to be used more. It's on, the use is on the rise, so we need to be aware. So there's evidence that it can damage the, the smoke itself when it enters your lung. There's evidence that it can damage the epithelial cells, um, the ciliated epithelial cells, sorry. Similar to how cigarette smoke works, right? And there's evidence that has amino modulating properties. It can um, downregulate your alveolar macrophages, and it can also cause a pro-inflammatory state in your lung as well. So this is the plant. And this is pretty much a slide that uh, talks about the different mechanisms of smoking. So there's the joint, there's the handheld water, uh, pipe, right? And this is the most worrisome one for me. This is uh, a, a water bong, right? So you can imagine, you know, bugs living in water and someone not cleaning this pipe and you're inhaling all this smoke into your lungs and, you know, whatever's in that pipe and the w growing in the water can cause infection in the lung, right? And this is uh, kind of a hybrid between um, the water bong and the pipe. It's like a handheld water bong. That chamber on the left side holds water. So K6. A 23 ml presenting uh, with a three-day history of fever, hemoptysis, and shortness of breath. Smokes more marijuana daily for four years out of a bong. Um, Physical exam, blood pressure is 88 over 62, respiratory rate is 40, O2 saturation is uh, 85%. Uh, he has decreased breath sounds on the left. This is his chest CT. So a uh, pretty extensive pneumonia involving all the lobes. Um, he was actually diagnosed with empyema and a small pneumo. You can see the pneumo on the left. Um, anyone want to guess what his sputum showed? Pseudomonas. And uh, the, the doctors that treated this patient were pretty savvy. They swabbed the bong to see if it grew pseudomonas, and it did. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so this patient was treated with six weeks of IV septacity and actually did pretty well. Um, so as we all know, uh, pseudomonas loves the water. You know, it's associated with hot tubs, contact lens, contaminated water. It can be found in our sinks, respiratory equipment. Right, so um, they concluded this patient was inhaling like large, large amounts of contaminated, you know, aerosol water into his lungs, and that's how he got the infection. All right, so the next case, 32-year-old male uh, presenting with feverish cough, weight loss over a period of several months. This is his chest X-ray. Right, so multiple cavitary lesions. Right. And this person was diagnosed with TB. Not necessarily. They had a, a diagnosed, undiagnosed TB. But they were, this patient was diagnosed, and they tested all the contacts, right? So they tested 12 contacts. Five were positive for TB. And guess what? Four out of the five shared the bond, right? And this was out in Australia. Careful. <laughs> and an another similar case in Australia. So a 32-year-old female was diagnosed with TB. 34 contacts were screened, three tested positive, and one person uh, shared the bond with the patient. So you can imagine the types of diseases that can be transmitted through this device, right? Yeah. So just be aware. And here's a study. You might recognize some of the names up there. Uh, Nancy Rihanna. Uh, Anna Velez and Dr. Sandine and Dr. John Green. So this is a study done at Moffitt, or a case series, sorry. And it looked at four patients that uh, smoked marijuana and they had a, a diagnosis of leukemia, right? So patient, or case number one, uh, this patient had AOL, they smoked marijuana, uh, they uh, just finished chemotherapy, they presented to Moffitt with neutropenic fever, and their CT showed uh, a nodular cavity on the right. Um, it was around 1.08 centimeters. They underwent bronchoscopy. Everything was negative, but uh, they were treated for uh, a nodular uh, 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 mold pneumonia with voriconazole mycofungin. And they got better and their symptoms resolved and the, um, uh, the nodule shrank to like, I think 0 0.01 centimeters. 
The next patient, patient two, uh, had AOL, smoked marijuana, presented with respiratory symptoms to Moffitt. Uh, they completed chemotherapy about a week ago, and their chest CT showed a nodular pneumonia as well. They were treated with voriconazole for three months and completely resolved. Now the AML patients didn't do as well. So uh, patient three is an AML patient uh, in remission, smoked marijuana every day, chest CT revealed a nodular miliary pattern right here. Their serum galactomannan was positive. Um, and they also had skin manifestations of like a mold too. And this patient uh, passed from a disseminated fungal uh, mold infection, despite being on infotericin and voriconazole. Uh, so in patient four is another AML, uh, but they were uh, relapsed AML. They're admitted for reinduction chemo. And this person smoked marijuana twice weekly going into their admission. And their chest CT showed some ground glass uh, opacities. And they also had eschar like lesions on their toes. Uh, so this patient died from presumed uh, disseminated fusarium. So what does this all mean? What can we conclude from this? That if you have a patient that smokes marijuana, obviously if they have cancer, if they're gonna get chemotherapy, you wanna advise them against smoking marijuana, right? And you also wanna ask them how they're smoking marijuana. And if they're smoking from a bong or from something that uses water, have them clean it at least. You can give them that advice. So I got started, so I started to research why um, these uh, marijuana smokers were uh, predisposed to mold infections. And I came across this article titled, Cannabis Microbiome Sequencing Reveals Several Mycotoxic Fungi Native to Dispensaries. So this study was published in 2015, and it looked into the microbiome of the marijuana plants, um, and these marijuana plants were being sold to dispensaries in, located in Amsterdam and Massachusetts. And they use uh, gene sequencing to identify mold and fungi located on the plant or pre present on the plant. And what they found was uh, penicillium was on the plants, aspergillus, and crypto was on the plants too. So it's pretty interesting stuff. And uh, my talk's almost over, but I want to mention a few other things. So there's a phenomenon known as Saturday night fever these patients present with fever, hyponatremia, encephalopathy. They might have a history of MDMA use, which is also referred to as ecstasy. Uh, Steven Johnson syndrome, obviously you can get it with any drug, but it is associated with FLACA. Acute hepatitis, um, amanita mushroom. Um, I think Colorado recently made psilocybin um, um, legal for recreational use. And let's not forget the meth mouth, right? Multiple dental caries with gingivitis, uh, methamphetamines. The idea behind this is saliva helps neutralize um, acids in the mouth, um, causing tooth decay. It has a cleansing effect of the mouth and has antibacterial properties. And here's a picture of meth mouth if you guys forgot. So in summary, um, cocaine, um, acute eosinophilic pneumonia, crack lung, sinus infections, body packing, bowel ischemia, perforation, IV drug use or skin popping, skin soft tissue infections, endocarditis. I didn't mention septic arthritis, pyomyositis, and of course, osteomyelitis. Uh, marijuana, uh, consider mold infections, and you know, ask you know, your patients how they're smoking it and advise them to clean it. Obviously, they shouldn't be smoking it, but you know, people have their own ideas and of what they want to do, right? And thank you for listening, guys. <laughs>